الحمد لله وكفى وسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى اما بعد اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم we are doing surah yusuf verse number 11 verse number 12 the last session we were at this point of the story where the brothers said that yusuf alayhi salam they made a plan in order to court their brother said that yusuf alayhi salam inside a well so now they came to the father and said that why don't you trust us but yusuf alayhi salam we're going to we're going to be we're going to take good care of him and then the other thing that is said this is verse number 12 arsil hu ma'ana ghada that send him with us tomorrow yarta so that we can eat well wa yalab and play wa inna lahu lahafizun and indeed we will be his guardians so one of the words that's used here is that send him to us so that we will play and i want to pause on this word and speak i think for the next 15 minutes or so about the concept of play games sports and recreation in islam the reason is because there is an image that some people have of islam that if i become too religious if i become too islamic then it means that i cannot play sports i cannot play games i cannot engage in recreation can people hear me online students they can hear me all right so there is a image that a person may have that if i become too religious or too islamic it means that i have to let go of these games and sports and recreation and being religious means that i have to let go of my friends and life will become dull and boring so it's important that we look at this notion because nothing could be further away from the truth than this this is a misunderstanding and it's important that we address this misunderstanding so there are a few points to remember about this topic number one that playing sports and games and having recreation that's completely permissible in islam not only is it permissible in islam but in fact islam encourages and emphasizes this aspect that one should engage in these sports and games and not only islam encourages but also these are rewarding a person will get a reward some sawab from allah and a person will be more beloved to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala engage in these things with the right intention and not only are they rewarding and meritorious in the acts in the eyes of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but the prophet says from himself the best of all best of creations and the sahaba the companions of the prophet says them and the early muslims they also used to engage in these sports these games But yes there is one thing to always remember that there are certain boundaries that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has drawn for us and those boundaries cannot be transgressed so we have to play games sports recreation within those boundaries so i'm going to start with that that what are those boundaries what are those conditions for the permissibility of games and basically there are four broad or basic principles to remember in this regard and if you can remember these then this will sort of help us clarify some of the confusions that people have about sports and games so again remember that there are four major or four basic conditions that we should remember four conditions about the permissibility of sports and games in islam the first condition is that when we play our sports and games we should cover our satr what is satr satr means the area from the navel to the knees that part should be covered so for example if you're playing a field game like hockey or or football so you wear shorts but you wear some shorts that cover your knees up to the knee length and you know this is not so difficult you know even if you're brand conscious and it's just one hand span of that extra cloth right and if you uh, you know allah will be pleased with you and it's so easy to sort of do this to follow this ruling you go to any top you know top brand stores nike adidas yes and they'll give you shorts for your knee length all the top brands they offer such shorts and you know how difficult is it to just to fulfill this condition 
Just cover that part and then you're set, you can play those games. The second condition is that when a person plays, then there shouldn't be a free intermingling of gender. Uh, so for example, not that you're swimming, but men and women, they're doing it together in one pool. It should be separate. They should not be doing it combined in the same pool. And you should have different times when this is done. So there should be some level of segregation. There should not be a free intermingling of the gender while playing these sports. The third is that, and this is especially relevant for our computer games, I'm going to speak about that as well, that the content should not be indecent or vulgar. So not that you are playing a game or playing a, a sport where there's some level of vulgarity or indecency. Some of the computer games have uh, such characters which are sort of vulgar or they're, they're maybe not dressed even. So that would be another aspect to look into, that the content should not be vulgar, indecent, or un-Islamic. And the fourth and the final condition is that when a person plays these sports, we should not become engaged in them so much that one ends up missing their salah. So watching cricket is okay. You can watch your cricket, Pakistan, India, as a first match, final, semi-final. But don't be so engaged and so engrossed in that that you end up missing your salah or you become heedless of your salah. That should not be the case. Right, so there are four basic broad conditions, and if we, we can even summarize them into two basic points. I'm going to speak this in, I'm going to tell this in Urdu, that when you play these sports, one thing is that Allah Ta'ala ki hukum tote nahi or chute nahi. Right, two things, that Allah Ta'ala's hukum, the commands of Allah, one should not break the commands of Allah, and one should not leave the commands of Allah. So don't break them by doing anything which is displeasing. And don't leave the command, don't be so engaged and preoccupied that one ends up becoming heedless and then leave that act itself. So if there is any sport which fulfills these conditions and it's permissible. And you can see the beauty of the deen of Islam that it has given us certain principles. Now from now until the end, you know, there'll be so many new games, there's so many new sports, so many new ways of entertainment and recreation will come. And it will keep on emerging in every zamana, in every generation. But the beauty of Islam is that it has given us certain principles. We can use these principles and through them we can judge and whether to see if this sport is going to be permissible or not. So for example, now you play football. If you're playing football, you don't miss your salah. And it's not being played in a combined sport. There's sort of, it's just men or women separate, separately. And you also cover your knees, right? You cover your knees, your satur is covered. Then by all means, go and play. No one stops you from playing. You can play football is fine. Playing hockey is permissible. Playing volleyball is permissible. Throwball is permissible. Badminton is permissible. Uh, basketball is pres permissible. Wrestling, kabaddi, that's also permissible. Swimming is permissible. Running. The, the athletes, right? The, the sports, the field sports, they're also permissible. Archery is permissible. Horse riding is permissible. All these things are fine, right? But the usul is there. Usul is that don't break the command of Allah and don't leave the command of Allah. So there's a sport chess. People ask you about chess. It's a game where sometimes people become so engaged, so preoccupied that they won't even know about their salah. And for that reason, some jurists felt that there was a dislike. This is dislike. But then the Maliki jurist said that, no, if as long as a person is conscious about their salah, and they don't miss their salah, they don't neglect their salah, then with that condition, chess is also fun you can play. What about computer games? Computer games are also the same way. Like chess, that, you know, yes, there is a fiber. There's not a physical fiber, right? But, you know, there's not physical exercise. But definitely, it's intellectually, there's an exercise that is happening. The strategy games, you have hand-to-eye coordination, strategy, same rule applies. So as long as you don't break the command of Allah, you don't leave the command of Allah, they're also fine. You can play. You can play any of these computer games that are out there. So in Islam, playing sports is not just permissible. In fact, Islam takes it to one level more than that. Allah SWT encourages one to engage in sports which are beneficial, either for their health, for their intellect, for their mind. Islam encourages that one should engage in such kinds of beneficial sports and activities. 
all sports, whether they're benefiting us physically, mentally, emotionally, in whatever way Islam encourages that. Islam wants us to keep, you know, to exercise, to engage in exercise. We don't want to make weak believers. We don't want to make a person who can't even walk, can't even race, right? Never able to run. That's not the concept that Islam is given that you become so crippled and so paralyzed that you, that you don't even do, you're not even physically strong to be able to do anything. Like you say in English, that a sound mind is in a sound body. If your body is sound and active and physically agile and able, then you can actually think well. You can think create, creatively. And a sound body, a good physical body, can be used for many good things, whether deen or the dunya. A sound body means that you don't have to worry about your health issues. Your physically, in terms of your health, you're strong. And such a person is beloved to Allah's father, who is strong physically, strong mentally. In one hadith, the Prophet said that al-mu'min, al-mu'min al-qaliyu khayrun. That a qadi, a strong believer, and strong could be understood in any of those ways, physically strong, mentally strong, intellectually strong, such a believer is more beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, has more khair, has more goodness in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than that person who is zayd and was weak. So we see that such a person will become beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is khair in both of them, a weak believer and a good and a strong believer, but such a person, a strong, will be more beloved to Allah Subhanahu There is more khair and goodness inside such a person. So we see that Islam encourages one to engage in these sports and games. And not only is Islam encouraging us to engage in these activities, but the best of best, the Prophet Sallallahu himself used to play sports. Now there is no more God-fearing, and this is another misconception that some religious people have. That if I become too religious, that means I just need to be in the masjid reciting Quran on the musalla, doing zikr, I have a in my hand, and I can't have any life without or outside of that. Look at the sunnah of the Prophet says, there's no one more God fearing, no one was more khashiyat of Allah, Allah, fear of Allah than the Prophet says, no one was more taqwa, and no one was more muttaqi than the Prophet says, the Prophet says, who witnessed the events of Jannat and Jannam with his own eyes, who saw Akhra with his own eyes. And still the Prophet Sallallahu he would encourage people to engage in sports, and not only encourage, but play sports themselves in order to educate and give talim to his ummah. So this is an aspect which not many people know, so I actually want to share some of those stories and hadiths with you about the kind of sports that the Prophet Sallallahu played, and what things are established clearly and explicitly from the hadith. So one thing is horse racing, horse riding. Once a person came and he asked Hazrat Anas that would you do horse racing at the time of the Prophet And did the Prophet ever raise horses when you were there? And he replied and said that I swear by Allah, Wallahi, that the Prophet himself used to race. And he would race on a horse whose name was Subha. And the Prophet Sallallahu horse once it took the lead and it won. And when it won, the Prophet Sallallahu became so happy on this fact that he won, and he, the Prophet Sallallahu himself was a bit amazed that my horse won this race, the more than my horse took the lead. And not only did the Prophet Sallallahu race on horses, the Prophet Sallallahu also would race on foot. A very beautiful story. Um, Aisha that the Allah of that Anna, she mentions that once I was with the Prophet Sussan, and the Prophet Sussan said to me that let's race. So the two of us, we raced, and the Prophet Sussan allowed her to win that race. And actually, you know, she won that race, but actually the hikmat was that the Prophet Sussan allowed her to win that race. Why? Because she would become happy. I mean, the Prophet Sussan, through this, was actually teaching a lesson how to make your wife happy, allow her to win. Later on, another opportunity came when she says that I put on some weight, and this time again, the Prophet said that let's race. But this time, the Prophet won. And when he won, he said, Tilka the Tilka, right? That you won last time, this time I won, this is going to be a return of compensation for that. So we see here that the Prophet himself could race, and also teaching us another lesson how to keep your wife happy, you should race with them, play games and sports with her. 
There was another Sahabi at the time of the Prophet Hazrat Salma bin Akwa radiallahu ta'ala. He was a known racer. He was an excellent athlete and a very fast runner. And in the books it's mentioned about him that he could run faster than a horse. You have today athletes, Usain Bolt, right? The 100 meter champion. Uh, he could run faster than a horse. And it's a very famous story. Once he chased many bandits away. And once, uh, you know, the Prophet system and, and the Sahaba come, they were returning back from a journey, returning back to Medina Tayyibah. And they reached the outskirts of Medina Tayyibah. At that time, the Sahabi and the Salma was there with the Prophet system. A man from Medina Munagra, an Ansari Sahabi, started shouting out and saying, that is there anyone who can race with me to Medina Munagra? I mean, some people, you know, they're so sure about themselves. The Elan can announce, but is there anyone out there on the open challenge, anyone who can race with me to Medina Tayyiba? So when Hazrat Salama Rabbi Allah only heard this, he thought this was a disrespect that the Prophet system is with us and you're openly challenging all of us. So if Hayratun ki And he asked the Prophet system that if you give me permission, permit me, I will race with them. And the Prophet system said, Tik, correct. So uh, when the Prophet system gave permission to the Sahabi, so he said that, okay, you start running, I'm going to come. I'll, I can take the lead. I'm going to race with you. And then he jumped off his camel, his animal, and started running with that Sahabi. And in that breathtaking race, Pele Unko, he gave him the lead. One valley, two valleys, that the opponent was in front of him. And then, Ranat Nagir changed here. And he started running, and he overtook and while he was overtaking, Halka sat him on the neck also, came now at your side, and then raced in front of him and reached and won that race all the way to Marina Tayyibah. This is a live example of two Sahaba Ikram racing in the company of the Prophet Sassam, with the permission of the Prophet Sassam, and the Prophet Sassam encouraging them to race. Then, not only racing was done at the time of the Prophet Sassam, we also have a story about wrestling. So once uh, it happened, uh, there was a believer, one unbeliever at the time of the Prophet system was very, very strong. This is, by the way, not wrestling at the WWF and WCW Nitro or the WWE. This is a, a basic level of wrestling where who will be able to throw the other person down on the ground? That type of wrestling, Kabaddi. So there was a person, unbeliever, very, very strong, and many people combined together could not throw him on the ground. His name was Rokana. So he had this ajeeb idea. He thought that if I ever get the chance to meet the Prophet Sallam, I will challenge the Prophet Sallam to this wrestling match. Right? So he had this khayal, the thought in his mind. So one day it so happened that he had 300 goats with him and he had taken those goats out on the field. And there he met the Prophet Sallam. The Prophet Sallam passed by. So he then challenged the Prophet Sallam and said that, would you wrestle with me? And the Prophet Sallam replied that, what if I win this match? What will you do? What will you give me? And the Prophet Sallam was mentally conditioning him before that, what if, you would have, what if I win? What will you do? What will you give me? And he said that if you win, then I'm going I'm to give you 100 of my goats. So the Prophet Sallam uh, went ahead and the Prophet threw him on the ground and then took the 100 goats. Now this person, he was shocked that what just happened to me? Uh, I want a rematch. <laughs> so then the Prophet said, fine. The rematch happened and again the Prophet threw him down. This time again he gave the second 100, 200 goats. Then again he challenged that, no, no, give me one more chance. And again the Prophet asked him, that, what if I beat you now? He said, the remaining 100, I'm going to give that also to you. So the third time, three consecutive times, the Prophet threw him on the ground. And now, by this time, this person was completely amazed. He was shocked that what just happened to me. And he said to the Prophet that before this day, no one had ever thrown me on the ground. And before this day, before today, I hated, I disliked no one more other than you. I used to hate you the most. But now, after this incident, I testify to you, I say, I recite the Kalama, 
ഈ റിസൾട്ട് എടുത്ത കല്ലാഹുഅല്ലാഹുഅന്ന മുഹമ്മദ് when he testified the prophet sallam said to him radd anhu ghanamahu the prophet sallam returned those 300 goats back to him this is also a way to give dawa this is also tabligh imagine here that the prophet sallam that being who has so much fear of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there is no other being who has greater fear than the prophet sallam someone who knows allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intimately deeply profoundly seeing the manazir of jahannam seeing the manazir of akhira knows the so many things and still here the prophet sallam is wrestling with a person in order to bring that person close to islam in ye jamara mizaj jo itna we think this is a misreading about people that if i become religious if i become close to allah if i become true islamic means that to let go of that i become a sufi i become such a person who has a musalla and that's be in my heart that's the misconception the prophet sallam himself is giving and leading by example and playing all these sports archery to take another example once the prophet sallam he made two groups of the sahaba and said that i want you to have an archery competition and then i am going to throw arrow from one side so the other side they they, they no one threw the arrow from their side So the Prophet Muhammad asked him that, "Ma lakum la tarmu? What happened? Why aren't you throwing the arrow? Throw!" So one of them said that, "You know, how can we throw when you're from the other side? Right? When you're on the other side, how can we throw?" So then the Prophet Muhammad said, "No, no, throw the arrow. I'm with all of you. Meaning, from once, you know, once I'm going to throw from this side. Second, I'm going to throw from the other side. Throw!" And the Prophet Muhammad himself is. looking after is encouraging the sahaba to engage in this competition of archery and in fact another riwayah the prophet says to give a very important encouragement that you should acquire this technology by which you can throw at the target that a weapon technology by which you can throw at the target this is 1400 years ago the prophet says to is giving a message to the ummah irmu warqabu practice archery and practice riding horse riding but you should practice archery because this is a habbu ilayya this is more beloved to me than the fact that you do horse riding and even today we know that those weapons which you throw they are considered to be more dangerous by the enemy they are more effective people are scared of that technology i won't take the name of that technology but you guys i'm in a university setting but you guys know what i'm hinting and indicating to us the weapon which you throw they are considered to be more dangerous the opponent is more scared about that 100% sure what the prophet sun said 1400 years ago as same is true even today people are scared of that technology and the prophet sun is encouraging that learn archery right learn this in another hadith the prophet sun said that all the past times of the muslim they are futile except for the archery the shooting of the bow the training of his horse and then playing sports with his wife for they are from the truth and then umar radi allah ta'ala no he also once in his own zamane khilafat he uh, sent a letter to one of his governors hazrat ubay ubayda bin jarrah radi allah ta'ala an and one of the nasihat one of the advice he gave to him was that teach your men swimming and archery we are learning that this is also an aspect of ibadah ibadah is not supposed to be confined with the masjid on the musalla or zikr with tilawat with quran this is also part of our deen this is also part of the sunnah of the prophet says you know the way of the prophet says so encouraged by allah allah is saying that such a person al mu'minu qawi that such a person is more beloved to allah taala this is a way through which a person can become more mahbub in the sight of allah by becoming physically strong intellectually strong mentally strong and you're also following in the way of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam doing it about the son of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in another hadith the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that indeed angels they don't participate in your futile activities except when you're competing with each other in some good sport when you're competing with each other in some good sport angels are watching all when you're learning archery or engaging in archery and what does that mean it means that if a person plays a good sport something which is going to benefit you a beneficial activity right a beneficial game or you're learning archery 
the angels are watching. Meaning all those sports which are beneficial for us, whether physically, intellectually, mentally, and you meet those conditions, which I mentioned at the start. Okay, you don't break the command of Allah, and you don't leave the command of Allah. Allah ka hukum na chutane pai, or na tutane pai. So, as long as you meet those conditions and you play, you should play. We are encouraged to play, and we are asked, we are encouraged to keep ourselves fit. Even swimming is also Sabbath from Hadith. And the Prophet Sassim also used to do swimming. In books of Sira, it's mentioned that when the Prophet Sassim came with his mother to Madinah Munawra, so there among the houses of Bani Najjar, there was a particular house which had a small pond filled with water. You can say like a swimming pool. And the Prophet Sassim told the Sahaba Ikram that I used to go to that house and I would bathe in that pond, and I would try to swim inside that pond. Later on in the caliphate of Sayyidina Usman radiallahu ta'ala an, once he came to Makkah Mukarma, and people in Makkah Mukarma told him that there is a place, a city nearby called Jadda, and you should go visit that place. So Sayyidina Usman radiallahu ta'ala an, he went to, to see Jadda, and he went there with the intention to think, to see whether this could be made into a seaport for the Muslims. And while he was there, he actually did swimming in the waters of Jeddah. So yes, we have to be strong believers. We have to be physically, intellectually strong. And sports are one way you can attain their strength. And like I said, that they're not just permissible in our deen, they're highly encouraged in our deen. And they're a way through which a person can acquire the love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we make God and Allah also give us tawfiq that we can fulfill this sunnah as well in our life of the Prophet system. If anyone has any questions, I can take questions at the end also, right? So then, Sayyidina Yaqub when this dialogue is happening, the brothers are saying that allow Yusuf to go with us, we'll take care, we'll play with him, uh, we'll, we'll ensure that he eats well as well. Sayyidina Yaqub he replied, Allah, that indeed it saddens me, it grieves me that you should take him away from me. When you have mohabbat for someone, you don't want to be separated from them. So in the Yaqub al Islam and Mohabbat, you don't want to be separated. Just even the thought of separation can put anxiety and worry in your heart. Like the mother, she has a child, she has a son with him. Just the thought that my beta will go abroad to study for four years, that thought sort of puts her and makes her anxious and concerned, right? That's just the nature of love. And I also fear that a wolf would eat him while you are unaware of him. Normally, this is what happens, right? When you go, when there's some old people going with the young, Initially, they take care of the young, but then after that, they get along with their own work. They don't care, they ignore the young, right? They become heedless of what the other people, the young people are doing. Even sometimes this happens in your babysitters as well, right? Babysitter, you hire a babysitter. Initially, when you're watching, they're also looking at the kids and sort of ensuring everything is going fine. The moment you turn away, and then mashallah, they're also into their own work, and then they end up ignoring or become heedless of what the kids are doing, right? But this is just human nature. So, as a Yaqub he had this firasat. He had this firasat that he was able to see the spiritual insight that this is what is going to happen. You're going to go your own way, and I won't fight Egypt. Now, this firasat is a concept which is spoken about in the Quran. What is firasat? This is firasat in Mu'minana. A nur that Allah subhanahu wa places inside the hearts of the true believers, through which they're able to get this deep spiritual insight, they're able to see. In the language of the Quran, this is called this quwwat e fariqa. Quwwat e fariqa. And the way to get this spiritual deep insight, this firasat, is by leaving sin. Allah has given us this golden principle in the Quran that whoever leaves sin, Allah will give this nur and furqan in the heart of that individual. In taqullah, yajal lakum furqana. That if you have taqwa, if you leave sin, then Allah's prophet is going to put this nur, nur-e-mu'minana, 
Desperasa de Mu'minana, the spiritual insight, this quwwat e furqan in your heart. And what is this quwwat e furqan? This is the ability through which you can do farq bain al haqqi wal batil. You can distinguish, discriminate between what is haqq and what is batil. Sometimes it happens that you have to make a decision. You don't know if this decision is going to be beneficial for you or not. But those who have been given this quwwat, this firasat e mu'minana, they can know. That if I walk this path and later on they might be in trouble on this path, they can abstain. And if I walk this path, apparently it seems difficult, but eventually this is going to be beneficial for me. They can make their decisions accordingly because of this fark, this nur that is there in their heart. And there are people who are blessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by this nur. This nur comes when a person leaves sin. Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anha, in his last stage of his life and was about to pass away, he called his daughter Amma Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha and said to her that when you distribute my inheritance, I want you to distribute this inheritance between two of your brothers and two of your sisters. And Amma Aisha radiallahu ta'ala she said that I have two brothers and I have one sister. Who's the second sister? And Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anha replied that your mother is expecting and Allah Sparta has given me that insight that she is expecting that you will have a sister. It's going to be a baby girl. So this is a nur e mu'minana of firasat that Allah subhanahu wa gives. Once a very famous person by the name of Junaid Baghdadi, rahmatullahi in the books it's mentioned about him that once he was having a gathering and a person came up to him having a long beard and dressed up with a amama, with a jubba, with a asa, apparently a very, very religious person. And he came to him and said, Oh, Junaid Baghdadi, there is a hadith that I am finding difficult to understand. Can you tell me the meaning of this hadith? And he said, What is that hadith? He uttered this hadith of the Prophet. That fear the firasat of a mu'min, fear this insight of a mu'min, for he sees with the nur of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Can you tell me what this hadith means? And uh, Shaykh Junaid Baghdadi Rahmatullah, he looked at him very carefully and then said that what this means is, O oh, Christian, recite the kalama and become a Muslim. And that person started trembling, that how are you able to tell? And his plan was that Junaid Baghdadi would give me some interpretation, whatever explanation, and I'm going to go back to my people and say, that he doesn't even have enough firasta, that he wasn't, even, he wasn't even, even able to identify and detect that I was a Christian. But Allah Ta'ala gives this firasat. Ittaku firasat al mu'min that fear the firasat of the mu'min, fa'innahu yanzuru bin nur Allah, they see with the nur of Allah, the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And how can a person get this? When they leave sin. That taqwa. So, there are stories about people in our history who were blessed with this nur e mu'minana, this firasat e mu'minana. The wife of Firaun, she was given this firasat. She was given this insight that when, he saw, when she saw the baby Musa, she accepted that let's not kill him. We will take care of him. He can be a source of benefit for us. Right there, because of her firasat, she took it. Similarly, the daughter of Sayyidina Shu'ib al-Islam, that incident was also mentioned in the Qur'an. She also, in one interaction with Sayyidina Musa al-Islam, she was able to know that Sayyidina Musa al-Islam is special. And she said to her father, that can we hire him? Because he is qawi yun ameen, he is strong and he is trustworthy. And in one interaction was enough. This was her firasa, her insight that she was able to identify. That he was going to be a Nabi of Allah subhanahu wa become Kalimullah. There's also one other personality, personality who had this deep firasat, and that was Hazrat Khadija radiallahu ta'ala. One interaction with the Prophet before the Nabuwa, before the manifestation of Nabuwa, and she was able to identify that there's something. And she gave a proposal, and all of us know, right? So this firasat and mu'minana is part of our deen, and this is also what Sayyidina Yaqub alayhi had. And that's why, because of this firasat, he said that I fear that this is what is going to happen if you take Yusuf al-Islam away. That I fear that the wolf will eat him while you are unaware, while you are a ghafil of him. 
He didn't say that you will become zalim. Because when one does sin because of ghafla, because of heedlessness, then that person is ghafil, he's not zalim. Right? And we see that ghaflat is also a big problem for us. It becomes a source of many of our disputes, many of our fights. That's why Quran Allah says, Wala takum min al Don't be among those who are heedless, who are absent-minded. And especially in our, in our relationships, which are our close relationships, relationships of love, in a relationship between a lover and a beloved, ghaflat is not accepted. Ghaflat kabul kabul nahi hoti. Right? In a husband-wife relationship, Ghaflat is not accepted from either side. And sometimes we see that if you have ghaflat, then that creates problems and issues, flashpoints in that relationship. My husband, he doesn't want ghaflat from his wife. The wife, she would say that half the minute, time in here, right? You don't have time for me. As well, they always say the same thing. You don't have time for me, you're always cooking. Right? So ghaflat becomes a source of fights and disputes. In terms of parent and children relationship, that also of the parents they complain made a bit of shadi okay. Now he doesn't even have time for me, right? Ghaflat. So what does ghaflat mean? Ghaflat means that you're so busy, you don't even have time for the other person. You become careless. That's the other way to put it. Careless, right? And being careless then becomes the cause of complaints. People complain, and this can also be a source of issue and have a relationship with Allah subhanahu as well. So, when Sayyidina Yaqub al-Islam gave this reason, they immediately replied, all of them, Kalu, Kalu tells us that plural, that all of them got together and tried to convince and overpower their father, all of them they said, that la'in akalahu dhe'abu, that if a wolf should eat him, wa nahnu usba, while we are such a strong clan, we're strong, we're with him, then that would mean inna idan lachasirum. Then indeed we would be among sore losers. And how could that how is that possible? That's never possible. If that ever happened, then surely that would be a very shame and embarrassment for us. Anyway, the the, the story sort of that conversation ends, and it seems from the context we understand that we were eventually able to convinced Sayyidina Yaqub al-Islam and Sayyidina Yaqub al-Islam then sent his son Sayyidina Yusuf al-Islam with them and now they went, right? They now they went ahead with their plan. <laughs> so they convinced their father, they took Yusuf al-Islam, then they went out, they took out, they took him out with them. <laughs> and then they agreed to put him into the bottom of the well that was their plan to take Yusuf al Islam and put him inside the bottom of that well. They went ahead and carried out that plan. Right at that time, now one thing Allah's Father is doing here to help Sayyidina Yusuf al Islam. But we inspired, this is the royal we, that we inspired Ilaihi to Yusuf al Islam. Allah sent a wahi, a revelation upon him. Be amri him haza. That there will come a time in the future that you will surely inform these people about what this amal, this amal, this action that they're doing to you. They're putting you inside the well. There will come a time later on when you will be the one to inform them of what they did to you. And at that time, they would not have sure. They would not be aware. They would be, won't be able to perceive your identity at that time. Now, this is how Allah subhanahu wa helps his servants in a trial. That before Allah subhanahu wa puts them in a trial, Allah subhanahu wa gives some tasalli, some consolation to their heart. Here, Sayyidina Yusuf al-Islam, he had to be thrown inside the well. And this would sadden him a lot. Right? This amal would naturally cause grief, sorrow, sadness. So before that, Allah subhanahu wa is providing tasalli and consolation. And this has always been the sunnah and the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That those people who are loved by Allah, those people who love Allah, who have a ta'aluk with Allah, who try to develop this relationship with Allah, they obey Allah, Allah subhanahu wa never lets them down. Allah never makes them stranded. Allah never puts them away. Even when they have to go through some test and trial and tribulation, some grief, Allah gives them consolation. 
Allah gives them tasalli. Allah supports them so that they remain contented during that trial. Even when they're going through that trial, apparent trial, tell me there is contentment, there is itfanam, there is solace, there is tranquility, there is serenity. Allah ka khas ek fazal hota hai, Allah ke khas karam hota hai. This is Allah's special help, assistance and support for such people, for those who are the true servants of Allah, for those who make themselves pleasing to Allah's father. For example, if you look at the story of Sidra Musa Islam's mother, she had to put her son inside a river. But before that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed, Allah says in Quran, Wa the same word, awhayna, we sent a revelation ila umme Musa on the mother of Musa salam, that she should suckle her son. And then when she fears for him, she should put him inside the river. And then, la takhaf wa la tahazan. Don't be fearful and don't have any grief. Indeed, we will return him to you and we will make him one of the messengers. Right? So, on one hand, she is receiving the news of sadness and sorrow. But on the other hand, Allah Subhanahu is giving tasalli and console in the heart. This is the way Allah Subhanahu wa helps and assists his servants, those who make themselves pleasing to Allah. In another story mentioned in the Quran, the Ashab al Kahaf. There also, what does Allah Ta'ala say? Fa'bu ila al Kahafi. Then, when you have withdrawn from them, retreat to the cave, go enter, live inside the cave. Yanshur lakum rabbukum min rahmatihi. Your Lord, your Rabb, will spread out for you his mercy. Allah will broadcast his mercy over you while you're inside that cave. And Allah will prepare for your for you an affair which is easy, which Allah is going to facilitate for you. Allah is going to make the matter easy for you, make the affairs easy for you. So again, on one hand, they will be tested, they will be going inside that cave. That's a difficult trial. But before that, Allah Subhanahu is giving them this tasalli, this consolation, that don't worry, you will receive this. Mercy of Allah SWT will make this matter easy for you. This is what happens. And we see this in countless other occasions as well. In our own Ummat, Ummat of the Prophet Imam Ahmad bin Hamad Rahmatullah once he was in prison and he would be lashed in that prison. It's a long story. But before he was in prison and before he would be lashed, and these lashes are very intense and severe. One lash, if you would lash an elephant with that, the elephant would start traveling. And he would be lashed 70, 80, 100 times in one day. But before that, Imam Shafi Rahmatullah was his teacher. He had a dream. And in that dream, he was blessed with the ziyarat of the Prophet. And the Prophet said that a test and a trial will come on Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal. And Ahmad bin Hanbal will succeed in that trial, in, in that trial and test. So Imam Shafi then sent a messenger to convey this dream to Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal. And Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal was so happy to hear that he gave his own shirt to the person who brought this glad tidy. That if the Prophet is saying that I'm going, to be, I'm going to be successful. So this is how Allah subhanahu wa helps. Today also, the same principle applies. Whoever attaches themselves to Allah, Allah will help them. Whoever makes themselves pleasing to Allah, Apparently, their halat might be against them, their difficulties in their life, people might be oppressing them, persecuting them, suppressing them. In a zahari tawr pe aapko lag raha hai ki what a tough time. But Allah Ta'ala will be giving tasalli to their heart. Allah will be supporting them. Allah will be strengthening their heart. Allah will be showing to them that there is light at the end of the tunnel. Allah Ta'ala will give tasalli. And like here also, Allah Ta'ala is giving tasalli to Sayyidina Yusuf Alayhi So that he becomes content right now, that he can right now, I am being placed inside this well, Rayabatil Jub, the bottom of the well, but there will come a time when Allah Ta'ala will take me out. There will come a time when Allah will take me out from this zillat and give me isat. And that time will come. So this is how Allah subhanahu wa deals with his servants. Allah helps his servants. So after throwing Sayyidina Yusuf al-Islam at the bottom of that well, 
the brothers, they came back, they came back to their father at night time just to strengthen their case further. So in order to strengthen their case, they're coming at the night time. And second thing, they're weeping with tears in their eyes. And they're crying. Why? Because they want to make their case strong. In the heart, right? they're, they're hiding. But always remember this principle that those who have a weak case, their voices are the loudest. And on the other hand, that person who has a strong case, strong evidence, strong dilat, he will speak with confidence, he will speak with maturity, with a with level of calmness, right? So the brothers, so they came back crying, and this was a very different type of crying. This was a crying to strengthen their, strengthen their case, strengthen their mukaddama. It's like crocodile tears, right? And uh, interestingly, the Quran is also mentioning that men can also do this, right? It's not just only women who have this art of doing crocodile tears. They also, the men can also have these crocodile tears and they were able to convince, manage to convince their father, right? With these tears. Yes, crying can sometimes melt other people's heart. But even if you are crying in a fake manner and you're able to convince creation, but you cannot attract the mercy of Allah's father. And that's what they were deprived of. They convinced him. The father was also not convinced, right? But they were deprived of this mercy of Allah's father. On the other hand, and I want to just keep one or two minutes about this as well, that if a person cries with real remorse, with real nadamat, with real regret, then you can think metaphorically it will melt the heart of Allah Subhanahu wa Right? It comes in a rivaya that the tears of a person are so valuable, so beloved to Allah Subhanahu wa that on the day of Qiyamah, there will be a person who will be presented before Allah and he will have done so many sins in his life that the sins will become so heavy that, uh, that one side of his sins will weigh down. And he will not be able to think about any amal, any good amal that he, that he has done, any azim amal that could tilt the weight in his favor. And right at that time, he would be told that once something happened to you, once you felt true remorse in your heart, true nadamat, true regret in your heart, and you didn't even cry at that time, but nadamat thik sharam thak, and because of that, a teardrop formed on your eye. And it formed and just moistened one eyelash. And Allah Subhanahu wa values that so much that even one teardrop, teardrop like that, which moistens one eyelash of your eye, that could be placed and it will outweigh all of his bad deeds. Allah. This is Allah Ta'ala, Ar-Rahman. This is Allah Ta'ala being Ar-Rahim. Which moistened one eyelash of your eye, and that was enough to tilt the favor, tilt the weight in his favor. That's why another hadith is the Prophet Sidna Jibrail al Islam. He came to the Prophet and said that, O oh, Messenger of Allah, we can weigh all the actions of believers except for his tears. But because of these tears, Allah can extinguish an ocean of fire. This is such a big blessing that we have in our deen, that Allah has given us the ability to cry. And we should ask Allah Ta'ala for this ability to, to cry. We'll make God so many things. This is also a very big name. It's a very big Islamic scholar who belongs in the Indo subcontinent region by the name of Hazrat Abbas Hazrat Ashraf Ali Thanvi Rahmatullah. Whenever he would make dua, he would, and he would cry in his dua, he would rub his face, rub the tears on the entirety of his face. It was a very unique style of sort of rubbing and sort of rubbing your face with the tear. So one of his students asked him that, why do you do this? And he said that in a hadith, the Prophet said that one, whenever a person who cries because of his sins, because of remorse over his sins, or they cry out of a love for Allah subhanahu wa then the part of skin which touches those tears, right, 
that will not be put inside the fire. Let's go mal leta, that the entire thing is safe in the fire. Why does Allah Taala love these tears so much? Because the tears is a commodity which is not there in the heavens. The angels can do the ibadah; they can they, they obey Allah, but they cannot die. They cannot cry. They cannot shed tears. And you know things which are imported that are of higher quality, higher value, higher price. That's the rule. You don't have it available here. That's why the price goes high. Our tears are imported quality there. That's why their value goes high. It's not there. The angels don't have tears, so that's why their value increases. That's why they're so beloved in the eyes of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. In one of these, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that Tuba li man malaka nafsahu that Mubarak ko glad tidings for that person who's able to do three things. Number one, malaka nafsahu who restrains his nafs, apne nafs ko kabu kar leta. Wa was wa was wa was yata baita hu. And whose house is expanded is wasi. His house is wasi. Oh, wa baka ala khati atihi on jo apne bunao ke ro sake. Right. So one of the things that's mentioned here is that one can cry on his tears. Glad tidings, Mubarak Bad is for such a person. Right. So we should ask Allah Subhanahu wa Taala for this name and for this ability to cry out of remorse over our tear, over our sins. Or because of love for Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. So when they came back, and now they're giving the lion and reason to their fathers, they said, "Alu." They said, "Ya Abana, O our father, Inna Zahabana." That we went, Nastabiyaku went racing with each other. We were competing with each other. What Tarakana Yusufa Inda Mata Ina, and we. Left with Yusuf and Islam, with our belongings, with our possessions, that you can take it, we will raise. Allah will zeal, and I will feed him. Wama anta bi mu'minin lana, but you would not believe us. This is classic reverse psychology, right? That you would never believe us. Walau kunna sadiki, even if you are truthful, you won't believe us. Now, you know, this is how the the brothers. That's their psyche. That's how they're approaching. Right? That's how they're trying to come in, convince their father that we know that you will never believe us. But this is really what happened. And then, in order to again further strengthen their case, what did they do? Wajahu ala kamisihi bidamin kazir. They brought upon his shirt this false blood. Right now, the brothers they're putting fake blood on the shirt of Sayyidina Yusuf al Islam, and this is a horrific thing to do, right? They were claiming that they were not even able to find the body of their brother, <laughs> right? Aji, right? That the body was completely eaten up, mauled, or dragged away by the animal, by the wolf or whatever, right? To its den. So you could just imagine what the father is feeling. But now look at the response of his father. Look at the response of Sayyidina Yaqub alayhi salam. He says, "Allah, bal sawalat." What you're saying is, I don't believe you. I don't believe you. Your nafs, your soul, as your egos, your desires have enticed you to do something. You have been misled. You have been duped by your nafs. I don't believe the matter that you are explaining it to me. Something else has happened, and your nafs has enticed you to do something else. As for me, what am I supposed to do? For sabr on Jamil. For me, beautiful patience. That is going to be my response. Wallahu al-mustaanu ala ma tasifun, and Allah Subhanahu is the one whose help I will seek against what you are describing. So from here, I want to take a further ten, eleven, twelve minutes or so to explain this concept of sabr e jamil, because this is again a concept which many people have difficulty understanding. Because a lot of us, there's no human being who says that life is rosy for me. Whatever I want, that's what's happening. All of us are going through difficulties, maybe not of this level, but difficulties, stress, trials, and tribulations. And then, and and then the question that many people have is that how are we supposed to respond? So one basic principle to remember is that why does Allah Subhanahu wa Taala sense these difficulties? And there are multiple answers, multiple reasons why. Does Allah send these difficulties in our life? Number one is that this dunya is an imtihan ka. It's an examination hall. And as students, all of you will understand this. 
that there are three types of examinations. One is a written exam. The second is an oral exam. And third is a practical exam. What is a practical exam? When you're asked to do something, right? And this life is also a practical examination where Allah will send question papers to you in terms of halat. Good halat, that's a question paper. Bad halat, that's also a question paper. The way you act will be your response, will be the answer. And this is an open book. Allah has given you the answers already. That if Allah sends good halat, you're supposed to respond with a shukr. That's the correct answer. And if Allah tests you with bad halat, you're supposed to respond with sabr. That's the correct answer. So this life is test. Every single person will be tested. And in Quran, Allah has laid down this principle very clearly. That surely, certainly, undoubtedly, we will test every single person. All of you will be tested, whether with some type of fear, hunger, loss of wealth, loss of children, loss of your plants and crops and fields. Every person will be tested. But when musibah comes upon you, how are you supposed to respond? You're supposed to look, you're, we're supposed to take lesson from a tree. If, it, if you've seen a tree, if there's spring season, the leaves are out there. But in autumn, it doesn't happen here, but in the US especially, we see that it sheds off its leaf, it lowers itself. So when things become difficult, you just become ajis, humble, you lower yourself. Right? And what does Amatala say? Wabashir is sabri. That you should exercise patience when things are difficult. When some taklif or difficulty or hardship comes in a person's life, and at that time, if one exercises sabr, then such a person would become the beloved of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is an easy way to become the mahabub of Allah. Allah says in Quran, Wallahu yuhibbu sabri. Allah loves those people who are patient. And it's so difficult for us to become the mahabub, the beloved of Allah, you know, through taqwa or leaving sin or there are many other routes to become but those are difficult ways. This is one easy shortcut to become the beloved of Allah that when some difficulty comes and you exercise patience. In fact, when a person does, has sabr, Allah says in Quran that that person is blessed with ajran bighayre hisa. For everything there is a reward but there is a scale that if you do this, you will get this. If you do this, you will get this. Sabr is one amal, the his sabr. If you have sabr, Allah is going to reward you infinitely more. And if there is no upper limit, there's no maximum reward, Allah will give you more according to his own shah. So whenever a gham or sadness or test or trial comes in our life, some tragedy comes in our life, that is a time when Allah subhanahu wa is sending his incredible mercy upon us. In Quran, when Allah mentions this ayat, Allah says, that those who are tested and tried and they exercise patience, and in that patience they say, Inna lillahi wa inna lahi rajiyon, that ulaika alayhim salawatum min rabbihim wa rahma wa ulaika humul muhtadun. Such people, they are being showered by Allah Ta'ala's rahmat, they're getting this rahmat from Allah, they're getting these salawat, these blessings from Allah's Ta'ala, and they're also getting hidayat from Allah Ta'ala. This is spring time for a believer. What more do you want? You're being showered by Allah's rahmat, by his salawat and blessings, by hidayat and guidance. Means that when things are going tough, if a person can turn to Allah's Fatala, then this is what Allah's Fatala is going to give. This is apparently, outwardly, things are difficult. Things might seem difficult for you, but the hakikat, the reality of the matter is that Allah's Fatala is sending. If you can have sabr, Allah will send those amazing rahmat and those incredible times of salawat and hidayat, which were not there when everything was going fine. So this is what Allah's Father is going to offer to us. Another reason why these difficulties come, they come in our life is because Allah wants to elevate our darajat. One reason why these difficulties come is because of our sins. A person makes a mistake. 
غم جگاتے ہیں when a person is غافل ہو جاتا ہے they went away from the path of Allah they're غافل heedless Allah wants to bring that person back you took the wrong exit he told Lady come back come back come back you're going on the sinful path Allah sends some difficulty so that this person comes back something happens in your life something happens in the life of you someone close to you and that's a signal that I took the wrong exit you can come back I feel that for you okay many times it happens that a person takes that as a as a sign they come back to Allah they start praying پہلے نماز نہیں پڑھے تو نہ اسٹارٹ کریں پہلے قرآن نہیں پڑھے نہ اسٹارٹ سیٹنگ قرآن نہ تو اسٹارٹ میکنگ دا وائٹ والا ریٹرن مور ٹو اللہ سبحانہ تعالی وہ تھنگز ار ڈیفیکلٹ بٹ مینی ٹائمز دیز ڈیفیکلٹیز ار سینڈ سمپلی ٹو ایلیویٹ اور درجات یو ہیو بین سین اللہ وانٹس ٹو گیو یو سم تھنگ اچھا اینڈ سم ٹائمز یو یور سیلف آسک اللہ سبحانہ تعالی فار دیز ڈیفیکلٹیز یہ بھی عجیب بات ہے You might be thinking, aisa kaisa ho sakta ki who in the right mind would want and request Allah Ta'ala for a difficulty, for a test or a trial. Ramadan mein Lailat al-Qadr happened. On that night you made the word to Allah Ta'ala that Allah, I ask you that you grant me Jannah to It was a special moment and your dua was accepted. Now, we don't have the actions that on the basis of our actions you can get Jannah al-Firdaus. So what does Allah Ta'ala do? Allah Ta'ala sends some difficulty in our life so that we can have sabr on that difficulty and because of that sabr, Allah can give us that Jannah al-Firdaus. So Allah wishes to elevate our ranks. In Hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu said that إِنَّ اللَّهَ إِذَا أَحَبَّ عَبْدًا إِبَتَ اللَّهُ When Allah has muhabbat for His servant, Allah puts him in a test. Ya Allah ki nishani hai ki Allah muhabbat karte. Fa'idha, when that person is razi with that test, First the Fahul, then Allah selects that, chooses, selects and chooses that person, makes that person a special servant. Now the question comes that when these tests, they come in our life, how are we supposed to react? Practically, what am I supposed to do when I'm going through a difficult time? Do kaam nahi karne or do kaam karne. One thing is that we are not supposed to complain. Sayyidina Yaqub is not complaining. ہمارے ساتھ ہوتا ہے کہ اسٹارٹ کمپلینٹ کمپلین ٹو پیپل شکایت رائٹ عجیب ہوتا ہے کہ جب دینا اللہ تعالیٰ کو ہوتا ہے تو جب اللہ سپاتر تو پھر ہم شکوے اگر کرنے بھی ہیں تو اللہ تعالیٰ کے سامنے کریں وائی اسپریڈ آور ہینڈ بفور ادر پیپل وائی اسٹارٹ کمپلیننگ ٹو ادر پیپل رائٹ ناٹ سپوز ٹو ناٹ سپوز ٹو And what we are supposed to do is, number one, make istighfar, increase in our istighfar, because who said that that difficulty came because of our sin? So we make istighfar, that Allah, it's because of my misdeeds, Allah, please forgive my misdeeds, and hence remove this difficulty from my life as well. And the second thing is to make dua to Allah, to turn to Allah and ask Allah for afiyat. That Allah, you know, I just make him zoro, I'm such a weak servant, I admit of my weakness and don't put this burden on my shoulder which I'm not able to bear. Don't put this weight, this responsibility, just no thani sakta. Allah may come zor sa bandha, just ask Allah ta'ala for asiyat. Allah grant me well-being in every aspect of my life. So the basic point is that when difficulty comes, instead of turning to makhluk, instead of turning and, and sort of objecting and doing shikwa and shikayate, One should do ruju ilallah. One should turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and one should make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, make istighfar for maybe the sins that we have done and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to remove this. Because that difficulty will come, it has come from Allah and the only being who can remove that difficulty is also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah ta'ala is fa'ali haqiqi. People, they don't have the ability to remove that difficulty. Wa khud apni musibatu mein basse. They're stuck in their own problems, in their own issues. If they cannot solve their own problems of life, then how can they solve our problems? So a better alternative is that instead of turning to people and asking them for help or complaining to them, we turn to one being who can actually remove those difficulties from us. We do ruju ilala. We turn back to Allah's father. Right? And that is what Sayyidina Yaqub is doing here. Actually, here another question comes that I understand that I'm supposed to do sabr, But sometimes the grief, that sadness, that, that, that test is so strong, so intense, that 
even you know you're supposed to do sabar but you're not able to do sabar aap kar nahi pa rahe so are there any techniques or strategies by which a person can make themselves among the sabari at such moment at such points at such points so i mentioned two or three techniques by which a person can reduce the gham or sorrow that they're feeling at that time one is to always remember that any time we are tested by any difficulty or hardship mare guna mit rahe hote hain ek chhota bachcha hota hai when a bachcha he saw him when a child he saw his clothes or his dress up his mother takes him to the shower and cleans and scrubs him so but that's scrubbing right scrubbing shampoo and you know soap and all of that that is what happens to us as well that sins came in our heart allah scrubs our heart polishes our heart purifies our heart by sending some difficulty and when we have sabr that becomes a mechanism by which allah subhanahu removes those sins from our lives purifies us the second thing to remember is that whenever some difficulty comes in our life and you recite inna lillahi wa inna ilaihi rajiun then you will get a reward from allah subhanahu taala and later on in your life you remember that same grief that same grief that same sorrow and again thinking about something that happened in the past again you become sad this time when you become sad the second time again if you recite inna lillahi wa inna ilaihi rajiun allah taala will give you will give you the same reward that you got the first time this is such an incredible mercy if you imagine if someone loses their child a mother she thinks about her, about her child so many times throughout the life she'll be thinking but every single time when she's thinking about that loss and she says inna lillahi wa inna ilaihi rajiun allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give her the same reward she got the first time when she said inna lillahi and the third thing to remember is that when you're in state of sorrow sadness and grief aur aap intezar kar rahe hain ki musibat kab dale wo jo intezar ki jo ghadiyan hain those are qubuliyat to aap those are moments when your thoughts will be accepted very special time in a riwayat it's come it comes that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with the broken hearted so whenever your heart is broken take that broken heart to allah allah will mend your heart will patch up your heart and trust me there is no human being who can mend up your heart if your heart gets broken if your heart broken if you go to some human being for solace and tranquility they will never be able to patch your heart if you take your broken heart to allah taala allah will patch it up allah will patch it up allah will patch it in such a way that you will get the joy of life so turn to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dua at that time shaitan jo hai this is the shaitaniyat of shaitan shaitan attacks us right at that time because shaitan knows that this is the qubuliyat of dua maka the qubuliyat of dua if this person only turns towards allah raises their hand and makes dua allah will accept this person's dua and at that time shaitan will take this was was to make you so depressed so pessimistic that the dua making dua will be the last thing on your mind and we lose that opportunity ye yeah, allah walon ko bas this is the marat that allah taala gives them this is the deep insight that allah gives them that they're able to capitalize on these opportunities that happen in their life and in such moments allah se khoob mangte hain they're turning to allah in such moments they're waiting for such moments in their life then when will such moments come so that we can now openly ask allah khoob allah se mangte hain par natan ko khoob ata bhi karte hain and i'll just end with this one principle that many times when you have these bottles of medicine on the back label it says shake well before use right this is also allah taala's habit ki when allah subhanahu wa wishes to use a person for the sake of islam allah wants to give qubooliyat to person honor to person izzat to person before that allah taala bhi thoda hilata hai allah taala also shakes that person to see whether this person is khota hai ya khada pakka musalman hai ya kachcha hum bazar mein when you want to buy a burden usko thoda hum maar ke dekhte hain ki ye solid hai if we are doing this for buying one utensil in the market then allah taala also wishes to see that my servant is he strong from the inside or not 
So sometimes these difficulties will come because Allah wants to accept you, because Allah wants to use you, because Allah wants to give you Izzat and honor. Sayyidina Ibrahim a beautiful example. He was tested by Allah, shaken by Allah, one after another in so many different ways. He was shaken. First, he had to let go of his, of his parents. Then he was thrown inside the fire. Then he was asked to leave his family in the middle of a low wind in a desert, barren, empty desert. Then told to sacrifice his son, one after another, shaken, shaken, shaken. But then he passed all those tests, and after that, Allah Ta'ala gave Kubuliyat. It's such incredible Kubuliyat, right? Such an incredible Kubuliyat building Baitullah Sharif. And from the progeny of Sayyidina Ibrahim, we had Sayyidina Rasulullah, and not just Sayyidina Rasulullah, all the Anbiya who came, they came from his progeny. Allah. And today, he is one of the most respectable figures in three big religions. The Jews, Christians, and Muslims, all of them, they look up to Sayyidina Ibrahim. This is Kubulian. In the Millata Ibrahima, or the Millata of Sayyidina Ibrahim, we have Guru Ibrahim. So, anytime when we are also shaken, if we can only turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, make dua to Allah ta'ala, and then have Husni Zan with Allah, think well about Allah. Then, Allah, if I can pass this test, Allah wishes to use me. So we make dua to Allah that the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant all of us that we can be ability to implement these teachings in our life. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to have this uh, attribute of sabr in our life. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us to to leave sin and get this taqwa and the nur, that nur in mu'minana, that firasati mu'minana. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also shower a special assistance and help and Help us always throughout all our trials and tests in this world. And may Allah subhanahu wa enable us that we can also make ourselves physically strong. We can also become qadi mu'min so that we can become more beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa akhiru da'wana alhamdulillah.